I want to start with a quick fill in the blank game today. U plus who equals conflict. Okay, U plus who equals conflict. Don't say their name out loud, especially don't point at them if they're in the room with you right now. But who are those that have that uncanny ability of getting under your skin? Is there a coworker that you just can't seem to get along with? And maybe it's a neighbor, especially in fall, that's constantly raking leaves into your yard. And especially as we're coming up on the holidays, Who's the person that you make sure to avoid at all costs at the Thanksgiving table? You see, conflict is something we all face, and how we deal with it can vary. How do you deal with conflict? Let me just give you a few maybe standard ways that we may try to deal with conflict. Okay, how many of you just avoid the person? You don't have to raise your hands, but I will. I'll be the first to admit that that one is me. Yeah, I dread conflict, and I'll avoid the person or the situation at all costs. Maybe it's checking outside before you grab the mail or roll out the garbage cans just to make sure that neighbor isn't out there. Or it's working extra late so you don't have to walk out to your car the same time as that coworker. Or sitting at the far end of the Thanksgiving table, right? All in efforts to avoid the conflict. Maybe there's others who say, well, I don't avoid conflict. In fact, I'm, I want to get into it. How many of you say, well, I'll fight with them. You aren't afraid of conflict. In, in fact, you may enjoy it a bit too much. And I can remember having a moment like this years ago as a young ministry intern. We would have these occasional clear the air conversations with our intern team. And there was always a lot of emotion involved. And thankfully, most of the time, it didn't involve me. So I just got to sit back, and I wish I had a bowl of popcorn, but I could sit back and enjoy the reality TV show drama in real life. Okay, maybe you hop on social media just to troll someone you disagree with. You've got no problem telling that coworker exactly what's bothering you. And maybe you're the person around the Thanksgiving table that people are avoiding. Well, here's a third way that we can handle conflict that's actually kind of newer Maybe it's not, but it feels newer in our culture. Okay, how many of you just simply cancel them? When there's conflict, when someone offends that troll on social media, we just say, you know what, they're dead to me. We're done. They don't exist. So today we're continuing in our series, What If Jesus Was Serious? Looking at eight statements from Jesus within the first 12 verses of his most famous collection of teachings, the Sermon on the Mount. And we've wrestled with Jesus' words of blessings, or as they're called in here, Beatitudes, and what they say about God's kingdom and our flourishing as humans. And believe it or not, Jesus has something to say about how we deal with conflict. And I'm just going to tell you right now, you're probably not going to like it. I know it's hard for me to hear. But our focus in this series is to what? Right? And is to take Jesus seriously. And if I could sum up the message today in a big idea, it would be this. God blesses those who are peacemakers. God blesses those who are peacemakers. Not the avoiders or the fighters or those who cancel others altogether. God blesses those who make peace. And I really wish Jesus wouldn't have said that. But it tells us something about the kingdom of God. When Jesus came to announce the gospel, it's good news. Why? Because God in Jesus came to make peace. Listen to how the Apostle Paul describes this in a letter to the church in the city of Colossae. Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. This is amazing, right? And then through him, meaning Jesus, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with what? Everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. God and Jesus came to reconcile 
or make peace with what everything it says it twice in there whether in heaven or on earth that's what jesus came to do to make peace he's a peace maker so it only makes sense that those who are peacemakers are positioned to be recipients of god's kingdom they are reflecting the heart of god before we get too far into this though let's read our text for today and we'll start reading at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 1, leading up to our verse today on peacemakers in verse 9. And we've had a few different folks from our home churches uh, read the text. And today uh, we have Judy Warren from our 1030 Sunday Home Church that will be sharing the scripture with us today. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the hillside and sat down. His disciples came to him. He took a deep breath and he began his teaching. Blessings on the poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is yours. Blessings on the mourners. You're going to be comforted. Blessings on the meek. You're going to inherit the earth. Blessings on people who hunger and thirst for God's justice you're going to be satisfied. Blessings on the merciful. You'll receive mercy yourselves. Blessings on the pure in heart. You will see God. Blessings on the peacemakers. You'll be called God's children. Thanks, Judy, for reading our text today. Right. Blessings on the peacemakers. You'll be called God's children. And there's a lot for us to dig in and discover from Jesus' statement of blessing here. But let's we'll start with a bit of context again for those on the hillside listening to Jesus. Okay, for those people, uh, there, was absolute, there was absolutely interest in peace. They were interested in peace. In fact, the Messiah that had been promised for hundreds of years and prophesied by, by many of their prophets was one who would bring ultimate peace or shalom to the people of God. The Messiah would, was, was supposed to restore the promised land to God's people and they would finally experience God's rest and his blessing and favor. And yet, like I'm sure we would, they were growing restless after hundreds of years. They were angry. They're frustrated. They wanted peace, and they're willing, if need be, to fight for it. And there's this period between the Old Testament and New Testament. There's this 400-year gap where we don't have any writings from Scripture. But that doesn't mean that nothing was going on in those years. In fact, in the year 167 B.C., there was a man named Judas Maccabeus. And there's a few different books in the Apocrypha called the Maccabees. It's talking about this family. But he was one who chased out the Greeks and restored not only the temple to the people of Israel, but their land. And he brought this temporary peace for a number of decades until, of course, the Romans came in and obliterated everything. They destroyed towns. They enslaved 30,000 Jewish people. They crucified 2,000 Jewish men in one day. Okay, In efforts to say this, don't mess with us. And this is the oppression the Jewish people are living under. And they're waiting for another, like the Maccabees, to rise and restore peace again. And they've seen it work, although temporarily they see it work through violence. And then Jesus comes and says this, Blessed are not those who fight for what's theirs, but those who make peace. This would have been an are you serious Jesus kind of moment like many of these Beatitudes were. And yet Jesus, he gave them all back to back. I mean, this would have just been overwhelming, I'm sure, just a sensory overload and this all the counterculturalness of what Jesus is saying. But let's look a little bit closer at this Beatitude because we can. And it, we'll start with the first two words that, that all these blessing statements have in common. Blessings on. And we've shared the word for blessing every week. It's the word makarios which in Greek means happy, blissful, fortunate, or flourishing. It's a direct translation of the Hebrew word ashrei, which means fortunate. And, and Jesus, he's announcing blessing for a certain way of being in the world. 
And I know we've emphasized this a lot of these weeks, that this isn't a to-do list for getting into God's kingdom. But rather, it's a description for the kinds of people that are best positioned to receive it. The good news of God's rule and reign in Jesus. But I'm sure as we've walked through these, you've felt some tension. Right? As we discuss each of these Beatitudes, they challenge how, you know, they sort of present us with this challenge of, of how we follow Jesus. And, and that tension is okay. Because if we desire to follow Jesus, you know, if we're looking to play Simon says with Jesus, we're looking to take on his way of living. And these Beatitudes are describing what life in God's kingdom looks like. So naturally, as we desire to follow Jesus, these Beatitudes will start to show up as we aim to walk as Jesus did. Hey, don't let this become a job description. I have to get all these things sorted out before I can come to Jesus. Hey, no. As we daily surrender our lives to him and aim to follow his words and way of living, right? Like this giant game of Simon says. His kingdom issue and his values will start to take priority. It'll just happen naturally. Okay, this isn't 12 steps. We're not making amends and sort of a step towards receiving God's love. Okay, rather, peacemaking is something God calls us to because we've received that in Jesus. Blessings on the peacemakers. And there's a big difference between a peacemaker and a peace keeper. Listen, I love to keep peace. It's one of my favorite pastimes or hobbies. Okay, what's the difference between a peacekeeper and a peacemaker? Well, peacekeepers, they are passive. They're going to not take initiative in seeking out peace. Or peacemakers are going to be active. They're going to pursue that. Okay, peacekeepers avoid conflict. They're not going to look for conflict where peacemakers are willing to wade into conflict. Peacekeepers walk on eggshells, trying to keep everybody at peace, trying to maintain their comfort where a peacemaker will humbly pursue reconciliation. Peacekeepers can harbor bitterness when someone disturbs their peace or their comfort, where peacemakers choose not to be offended. Peacekeepers don't share how they feel, again, in efforts to keep the peace, where peacemakers are not afraid to speak the truth in love. Now, Jesus wasn't a peacekeeper. He was willing to wade into the messiness of people's lives and bring peace, make peace. If we want to take Jesus seriously, then we're to be agents of bringing peace, his peace, into a fragmented world. And if I'm being honest, I'd rather not. <laughs> so it's so much easier just to sit on the sideline and, and keep the peace as needed, just like with my intern group. I'd rather just sit on the side and, and be an observer, be a peacekeeper. But that's not what Jesus calls us to. And there are lots of different personality tests you can take. I don't know if you've ever taken a personality test, but my favorite uh, is the Enneagram. Maybe you've heard of it. It's, it's become popular over these last few years. But there are nine personality types in the Enneagram. And as I took that test, my personality type, the type nine, ironically is called peacemaker. Okay? Something God calls me to. He's wired me for. But is it necessarily something that I feel comes naturally? And this can be difficult. Peacemaking can be difficult uh, when it involves someone else and us. All right? It's one thing for me to tell my kids to resolve a conflict. It's peace that doesn't cost me. But it's a whole other thing when it's you or me. Right? In efforts to make peace, we may have to lose something in order to make that happen. So how do we pursue peace with others? Well, here's what I know to be true. Peace with God equips us to make peace with others. Jesus has made a way for us to be made right with God. He made a way for reconciliation, for relationship with God to be restored. 
Because God doesn't call us something he isn't willing to do himself. And I love that. He listened to the Apostle Paul encourage another church in the city of Ephesus with this truth. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 14. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into in one people when, in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. So how does Paul start this encouragement? Right? He says, Jesus, he's the one. He started this. We pursue peace because he has brought us peace. And, and who is the us that Paul is talking about here? He's talking about the church. And the early church was a collision of different ethnicity and ethnicities, backgrounds, traditions, socioeconomic statuses. And in particular, one of the, the big dividers or big kind of groups uh, that broke down was between those who were faithful to Judaism and not necessarily just Jewish by birth, but practicing observance of the Torah or law. You have them that were just faithful. They were devout to God's way of living from the Old Testament. And then you have everyone else, those outside of Torah living. And they were known, kind of blanket known as Gentiles. And there was a stark difference between the ways these two groups lived. They had very different backgrounds. It would be like trying to mix oil and water when you get them into a room. In fact, uh, for, for a devout Jew, if a Gentile walked into their home, they would literally burn it down. Okay, They sat at different tables altogether at Thanksgiving. They weren't even avoiding each other, just different tables altogether. And Paul says there is sort of this dividing wall of hostility. He's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles in this situation, but those walls can look different for our culture today. Hey, maybe for you, it's it's you and your, your boss. Or maybe if we get political just for a second, it's between Republican and Democrat, right? Liberal and conservative. Or maybe it's between white and black or brown. Might be the haves and the have-nots. It's whoever is on the other side, the other side of that wall of hostility. And Paul is saying that Jesus is our peace. The reason Christianity changed the world is because they were willing to put aside their differences for the sake of a greater cause. Again, Jesus has modeled this for us by allowing tax collectors and Gentiles and Jews and zealots who were like, again, these that were seeking violence to gain back God's kingdom. And he brings them all together. And now he sent them all out to change the world. And they're showing that we can get, we can, they're showing us that we can get along, not because we're good people, but because of Jesus. And this collection of desperate types of people is known as the church. The church has always been and will continue to be the hope of the world. Because we can show a way forward, a way to move beyond hostility. And Paul continues in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, the church, okay, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility toward each other was put to death. Okay, the death of Jesus on the cross, he brings us all together, puts to death that hostility. You see, the self-righteous Jews needed the death of Jesus. And the pagan Gentiles needed the death of Jesus. And as a result, he has paid the price that you and I could not pay. And I've got an image here that shows a cross with the, the word peace going both vertical and horizontal. And on this horizontal line of the cross with peace, Jesus has made peace with us. We were enemies with God, our sin and brokenness keeping him at a distance. But Jesus came to us. He came for us by dying on the cross. Right? Our, his, our hostility towards God was put to death in him. And then that leads us to the horizontal line of the cross. 
that horizontal peace, just as we have experienced that peace from Jesus, we have been blessed to be a blessing. We've been given peace with God so that we can go and make peace with others. How do we make peace? We look to what Jesus did for us, right? And we follow in his footsteps. Blessings on the peacemakers. You'll be called God's children. In other translations, this might say, you'll be called sons of God. And what does that mean? To be called God's children or sons of God, it was a term of endearment. And, and think about this. Let's reminisce for a second. Have you ever been identified based on being the child of, of so-and-so? Okay, for me, based on how I, I look or something I say or do, being known as, as Alan's son. That's my dad's name. And besides the fact that we have the same haircut, there are certain things I do that remind people of my dad. I can't help it. It's part of who I am. And you may have the same thing happen to you from time to time with one of your parents. Okay, what Jesus is promising here is something similar. For those who make peace, who wade into the waters of conflict and pursue peace, Jesus is saying, you look like God. You share in his DNA in a sense. As we pursue peace, others aren't actually looking and seeing us. They're seeing the heart and character of our Father in heaven. And I know this isn't easy. I mean, maybe there are those that you've tried to be reconciled with. You've tried to make peace, but they won't take those steps. Well, let me encourage you with Romans chapter 12, verse 18. In this letter Paul wrote to the church in Rome, he, he encourages them with this, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Okay, do all that you can, all that you can to live at peace with everyone. And not everyone will let you. Not everyone will move beyond this. But as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And if we take that fill in the blank we started this message with and we tweak it a bit, here's what we get. You plus peacemaking equals peace. You plus peacemaking equals peace. And as I wrap up, I just want to give us a few next steps. And the first is this, become a follower of Jesus. So we've been talking about throughout this message, Jesus came to remove every barrier between us and God. He made peace by his death on the cross. And you may be thinking, why did he have to do that? Because our sin, the brokenness we all experience is that serious. But his love is greater. Because of his love for us, we can trust and believe that God is faithful and just. That if we come to him with our sin, he won't turn his nose up at us. He no, he's faithful and just to forgive us, cleanse us, makes us new. And it starts as we recognize the gap. We see our need and say, Jesus, rescue me. And I know he answers that prayer every time. If that's you, would you let someone in your home church know we would love to pray for you and help you take next steps in following Jesus. Another next step is this, pursue peace. Pursue peace. As we've been walking through this message, has there been someone that has come to your mind as we talk about peacemaking? Has the Holy Spirit prompted your heart? And I know this isn't easy, but listen, Jesus, right, he paved the way. He has modeled reconciliation, and he calls us to follow in his footsteps. If you know there is someone God is calling you to pursue peace with, here are a couple quick things to do. First, pray. Ask for wisdom and discernment. And then when you feel like God has given you direction or given you clarity on that, then go immediately, okay? Once you sense what God's telling you to do, don't drag your feet. But also go directly, go directly to that person. Okay, don't talk about this person you need to make peace with to everybody else. Go directly to them. And lastly, go humbly. Be willing to enter into the conversation. Listen well. 
Learn from Jesus how he went in meekness and humility to the cross. Humility is the soil for peacemaking. As much as it depends on you, pursue peace. And our last next step is memorize Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. And let me just read that for you in preparation for next week's final message in uh, this Beatitudes series. Blessings on people who are persecuted because of God's way. The kingdom of heaven belongs to you. Blessings on you when people slander you and persecute you and say all kinds of wicked things about you falsely because of me. Celebrate and rejoice. This is going to be fun next week. There's a great reward for you in heaven. That's how they persecuted the prophets who went before you. It takes some time to memorize. I know that's a bigger chunk. It takes some time to memorize and marinate on that. As I said, next week we're going to wrap up this series, which is hard to believe. But let's be those that pursue peace this week. God bless Oasis.